Her name was Chrysanthemum Pearl, which is a strange name, I'll admit. If you compare it to the names of her siblings, well, maybe not Wally, but Norval, Wickersham, Miggles, Boo Boo, and Thnud. She was an unusual girl, Chrysanthemum Pearl. She could create oyster stew out of chocolate mousse, even at the young age of 89 months going on 90. Give her a needle and thread, and she could outsew even the most talented seamstress. Her father would write of her often in Christmas cards and boast of her frequently at dinner parties. And why shouldn't he? He'd created her. I guess most parents create their children, but this case is a little different. Because when I say he created Chrysanthemum Pearl, what I mean is he made her up. He made up Norval and Wally and Wickersham and Miggles and yes, even Boo Boo and Thnud. I guess that's what you do when you're a man like him. What else would you expect but fantastical stories of oyster stew from chocolate mousse made by an imaginary girl named Chrysanthemum Pearl when at a dinner party with Dr. Seuss? Oh, here we go. Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Sweaty. It's no surprise that everybody celebrated your demise and now. Worms are eating your eyes So don't you worry your rotten head As you sleep in your sodden bed It's time to respect the dead It's time to respect the dead The dead. He's insane. <laughs> he is insane. I'm so excited <laughs> to hear about this um, this horny, awful man. <laughs> Making up an imaginary daughter is like by far the weirdest fucking that thing is, that someone could do. That is very weird. But now the oyster soup out of chocolate mousse makes sense. <laughs> You know, I had a storybook when I was growing up called Chrysanthemum, and it was about a little mouse named Chrysanthemum. And the the mean mouse at school, like the mean girl mouse, us basically, was like making fun of her name. And then their ballet (laughs) teacher was like, I'm about to have a little girl. I think I'm going to name her Chrysanthemum. And then the mean belly girl was nice to her. She was like, oh, my God, that's such a good name. (laughs) Okay, I love that she's a name shamer. (laughs) <laughs> um, it's very on brand It's very in for 2024 mm-hmm. We love shaming names on this podcast Well, it's hilarious I'm But I would sorry, not shame like, the name Chrysanthemum Chrysanthemum is a cute name No I love Somebody it. named like Like Harry Todd. Or like yeah. Something like that Like something fucking disgusting <laughs> Then obviously <laughs> Robert Kevin Oh God <laughs> So we're talking today about a Theodore, Theodore Seuss Geisel, born in 1904, experienced a lot of prejudice early on in his life, which is why it's a shame he decided to go on and do that to other people later, which Mm -hmm. is something that happens a lot on this podcast. Yeah, it really does. (laughs) It's a real bummer. It's one of the worst things about this podcast. Yeah. It's like, we've really learned a lesson from this. And the lesson is, it's only fun when you do it to somebody else. (laughs) As a child of two Jewish German parents, there was a lot of hate hurled his way, as well as his sisters. Mm. His childhood was like, boring. I don't want to talk about it. We're going to hop into his little life, his cute little life, um, when he is at Dartmouth in 1925. Which I'm glad that I Googled because I was doing my research and I'm like, Dartmouth is a stupid name for a school. Dartmouth. Whoever named this is stupid. And then I (laughs) looked up the pronunciation and I was like, they can't, they can't have fancy people going there and calling it Dartmouth. Um, And no, that was just me. Once again, we're finding that people growing up in the shadow of World War II and going to an Ivy League college turns them evil. Yeah. Like I think something about like growing up during a world war is really fucked up. Also, education, higher education, yeah. incredibly fucked up. Not two even thi- once. Two things that'll rot your your brain out of your skull. <laughs> and your soul. Mm-hmm. Her too. Your soul, it'll rot right in your head. Mm-hmm. 
So he was a frat bro, Sigma Phi Epsilon. That's cute. And was caught doing some alky with 10 other guys in his room, which was like, mm-hmm. No chill because possession and consumption was illegal because it was oh, prohibition right. times. Ugh, that so must have sucked. So I know. Boring. Imagine going to college when alcohol is literally illegal. Ugh. I mean, they seem like they were fine, but like. <laughs> First of all, imagine going to college. <laughs> Second of all, imagine going to college sober. Absolutely the fuck not. I would blow off a dart in my mouth if I had to do that. <laughs> The prohibition laws were in place from 1920 to 1933, and he didn't just have, like, one teensy little infraction. Like, he was thirsty, you know? He was a growing boy. He was in college. Yeah. What are you supposed to do there but drink? Like, Even back then, I would assume. And but drink. Yeah. This led to the dean of Dartmouth, Dean Craven Laycock. (laughs) <laughs> to kick, to kick oh my god, I love sentence. to do that. <laughs> it's my favorite. Craven Laycock is <laughs> fucking amazing. The Dean feeling Craven when you're Laycock. Laycock. <laughs> In like a very craven way. <laughs> Dean Craven Laycock kicked him off the Dartmouth Jack Lantern, which was like a 1920s cracked magazine, basically. In order to keep writing for the Lantern, uh, which I'm calling it because I'm not going to say the Dartmouth Jack Lantern over and over because I'm not a loser. Um, in order for him to continue to write, because he was kicked off, he had to write under a pseudonym, and he chose Seuss. Encouraged by Professor Wait, of wasn't Rhetoric. that part of his name? Wasn't that like one of his last names? So yeah. he was like, no one will ever figure me out. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to write it. He's really good at this. <laughs> <sighs> Which was encouraged by one of his professors, who was one of his bigger inspirations for writing while he was there. Well, that's um, cute. D- yeah, we love a little... Inspirational dead teacher. Dead poets moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pouring one out for the teachers in the audience. If you're a teacher, <laughs> pull out your bottle and have a drink, even if you're at school. His pet name is regularly pronounced Seuss, which is an anglicized version of his German name, but it's more like Seuss. Seuss. It was originally Seuss, which is like, I don't know that I love it. One of his co-workers, Alexander Lang from the Jack-O-Lantern, wrote, You're wrong as the deuce and shouldn't rejoice if you're calling him Seuss if he pronounces it Seuss. That was like a little rhyme that he made up. I know. Straight to jail. Yeah. Oh my God. The, the writers at that school must have been bottom of the barrel if these are the people that are working on the fucking. Well, I guess the real writers didn't want to work at the Jack O' Lantern, just the ones that love stupid little rhymes. <laughs> imagine, imagine like going to a college party sober with these guys. <sighs> like, unless we're doing like a run a train situation, I just, I'm not going. I'm not there. I think I will they not put like in that doorway. I think they put like cocaine and toothpaste back then, so maybe we'd be okay. Just us sitting there <laughs> in the corner <laughs> on the couch with our tube Pouring of toothpaste. Tube. Like, <laughs> eventually, he decided to just go with Suze because that's what everybody was calling him. And quote, he said it evoked a figure advantageous for an author of children's books to be associated with Mother Goose. So like right. Goose Seuss and Goose. They rhyme. I guess. <laughs> he loves rhymes. <laughs> he sure does. He had a doctor cuz that's what his father always wanted him to be, which is like a little sad, a little daddy's boy. I'm, I'm assuming make my that he never straight Conrad. <laughs> that's what my dad wanted me to be. I'm assuming that he didn't stay in college long enough to get his PhD. No. <laughs> So no. that then it's stolen valor. Yeah. And I'm joking. My father wanted me to be a union rep. <laughs> oh my God. That's so based. I know. You could still do that. <laughs> no, I'm busy. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm really busy making content, which my dad also loves. He like calls me like once a month to be like, I'm so proud of you. They, them, son. <laughs> <laughs> so... Susie graduates from Dartmouth. 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 (laughs) Then goes to Lincoln. Sounds like a fish. 
<laughs> I know. It's it's giving Bass Pro Shop. I almost said Bass Pro. I'm, Bass I should not Pro. be a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're out of practice. You never read. <laughs> That's true. I also don't have glasses on. So he goes to Lincoln College, which he intended to leave with a doctor of philosophy in English literature. But he didn't because he met a lady, Helen Palmer, who was like, drop that shit. Like, Mm. why be an English teacher when you make such bomb ass drawings? Like, I love a supportive, you have a supportive woman. Yeah. Yeah. She said, Ted's notebooks were always filled with these fabulous animals. So I set to work diverting him. Here was a man who could draw such pictures, he should be earning a living doing that. She was right, and she cashed the fuck in. Yeah. So Good for her. She knew. She was such a wife guy. Yeah. Like, I love that. <laughs> so in 1927, he leaves without a doctorate and goes back to the States, where like right away, he was sending out drawings and writings to agencies, magazines, publishers. He asked Life Magazine to publish a series of cartoons called Eminent Europeans, but the magazine was like, "Mm, no, that's okay. Mm. That's weird. We don't want that. The first cartoon he did get published was in the July 16th issue, 1927, of the Saturday Evening Post. And getting like one in was enough for him to be like, oh, I I can do this. Oh, so I can do this? Then I'm going to do this. And I love that. That's such a yeah. cute little moment in an artist's life when yeah. they're like, oh, wait, this thing that I love to do thing. might be the thing I get to do? Like, yeah. Really good feeling. Support him for that. Nothing later. But this, yes. <laughs> so they're like, fuck, fuck you, Springfield, you dumpy little fuck. And they moved to New York, New York, where I guess you need to be to be a where cartoonist. Where the artists live. <laughs> the big <You're>, city. <laughs> let's be real. You're a cartoonist. Um, you, <laughs> You're I don't just think mailing you def- them in anyway. Yeah. I don't think you need to be hobnobbing, but whatever. So within a year, he's hired as a writer and illustrator at the humor magazine Judge. And once he finally has like a a regular gig, he proposes to Miss Palmer because Aww. before he was like, I don't want to, I don't want to ask her to marry me and then just be this failed artist yeah. for <laughs> the entire time, like a miserable yeah. failure of a man. And I'm like, well, spoilers. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, there's, he's on this podcast for a cute little reason. <laughs> the first cartoon was published on October 22nd, and they were married before the end of November. Damn. Six months after he... I know. He moved in he on it. He locked that shit down. Yeah. He was like, now you're going to have that cartoon money, honey. <laughs> it's like literally cartoon money. Good. Like he draws it in his <laughs> in his office. <laughs> Six months after he starts, the first work signed Dr. Seuss was published. That's like his official one, not for the right. lantern. I do love a pen name though. Like yeah. it's it's I love a non de plume for straight people. One of the 1928 cartoons in Judge mentioned Flit, a bug spray made by Standard Oil. So about racism. He's his Art style as a cartoonist is very cartoony. He draws people with extreme caricatures, or he draws people as extreme caricatures. I mean, this and is a minstrel character. All of character. the ones for people of color are like specifically leaning into every racist trope you could possibly yeah. find. Like, these are there's no characters. excuse for it. Yeah, one hundred percent. There's no excuse for it. He later said, like, yeah, yeah, you know, probably shouldn't have done that. And didn't want those more racist works included in some of the the things that were published. But it happened at the time. And there's a lot of people who like collect these. The same way people collect of course. like yeah. those nasty what golly gollywags? Gallywags. Gollywags. Gollywogs, yeah. 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 And like l- little like mammy dolls and stuff. Like people it's like love a little, that kind of shit. Little it's Black like a Sambo. Little, 
little racist Royal Dalton collection or whatever. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. It's like precious moments, but for racist people from the South. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like very fucked up. It's very fucked up. Even if you just have precious moments, because those things are ugly, but then to also have something ugly and racist. I honestly think even collecting things is fucked up. You're not Ariel. Yeah. Grow up. <laughs> what are like, you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was talking to a fucking Mockingjay. Those are the ones that collect shit, right? A little little Mockingbird picking up all your shiny things. I think a Mockingjay is very specifically from The Hunger Games. Oh, I've never read those books. I just assumed it was a real bird. you basically have. (laughs) In pretty much all of his ads, the racism was like... It wasn't a feature. It was just like a little treat he added in. Like yeah. none of that was necessary. He at you, no point needed to draw these racist characters right. or even like, like I don't want to be like representation doesn't matter. But like if you can't draw a person of color without being fucking racist about it, then draw your ugly it. white people in your cartoon. Yeah. Like, I mean, it seems like he just liked the aesthetic of racism. Yeah. He was like, ooh, minstrel shows, so cute, so nostalgic. I remember those would, from back when I used to do, watch them. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> By 1936, he he's cashing in. He's famous. The flit ads were, like, <laughs> big for him. His This little racist... I feel like saying racist endeavor is a weird phrase. <laughs> it's his, his racist little, brand. People his were like, racist you know, branding. I didn't feel like I had any brand loyalty to um, a mosquito repellent until (laughs) until I saw these racist caricatures, and I don't know. I just fell in love. I'm I'm a I'm a flick guy now. It's like people who buy beer that says like there are only two genders on it or whatever. (laughs) Wait, is that real? No, but there's (laughs) that um, coffee brand that was like. Oh, that's right. It was the, like, like, we're made for Republicans. Yeah, the dark <laughs> roast, dark roast light skin blend or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Like, <laughs> which apparently they recently rebranded because they were like, oh, Republicans don't buy expensive coffee. They no, buy like they, garbage they drink Folgers. Folgers. <laughs> yeah. So by 1936, Seuss had traveled to 30 countries, no kids, no office hours, tons of cash. So living oh, that's the dream. Great. Here. What a life. Li- Right? Like living, laughing, lounging, luxurying. And he was taking his wife, right? Yeah. That's so nice. Being married to a famous racist cartoonist and getting to travel the world. Yeah. Racistly, I would imagine. (laughs) What (laughs) countries did you go to? (laughs) I imagine she's also a racist, so it was great. And you know it was the (laughs) Netherlands, Scandinavia, Germany. (laughs) <laughs> oh not not <sighs> anywhere further south than France. And this was back when. So like bank accounts were like literally just bags of money at the bank with your name in it. So that bag <laughs> must have been so heavy. I'm Walking assuming they have like a dollar account. sign and then like a name on it. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> because of his success and his popularity, they're now friends with the highfaluters. They're hanging out with bankers, hobnobbing with the bourgeoisies. This is such like, a weird way to get famous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Shitty racist cartoons for mosquito repellent. For mosquito repellent. <laughs> and suddenly you're hanging out with like courtiers. <laughs> it, it'd be like showing up at a party and be like, oh my God, who's that? It's like, I think that's the girl who came up with. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. Wait, but god. that actually is impressive. <laughs> well, and probably a little less racist. Yeah. I mean, I don't know her, but so they're hanging out with these people. They're taking ad work, like for more oil products. Um, because Flit was like <laughs> I'm pretty sure just like Oil propane based. in a can or something. I mean, that'll keep him away. <laughs> there, he's doing ads for like boat fuel and motor oil, and then for Ford, NBC Radio, for Big Sugar. Like he is, Damn. he's getting in. He's in the money. All, yeah, yeah. His first children book came out in 1931, and it was called Boners, which is just a great name. Did that mean something else? 
Uh, I have no idea. So Boners brutally topped the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. And this led brutally. to the concept. Brutally. <laughs> just brutally slayed topped the it. competition. <laughs> just topped it. Brutally. Just that boner the competition. brutally topped it. <laughs> and this led Ravaged to the conception of the, the competition. sequel. More Ooh. boners. <laughs> More boners. <laughs> just when you thought you had enough. <laughs> now there's more. It's like, well, okay. I'm back no, on board. I'm full up. <laughs> If I don't have enough holes, I'll make more. <laughs> oh, more boners, but I'm already filled to the brim. <laughs> <laughs> the book's sales and favorable reviews encouraged Seuss, and he wrote and illustrated an ABC book with very strange animals, but it didn't grab attention from publishers. I guess they weren't ready for his like nasty little mutants yet. Right. His who's or his whatever. Way- yeah. Ugh. <laughs> On his way home from Europe with What's Her Nuts, he was like listening to the rhythm of the ship's engines and it inspired a poem that would become his first children's book. That's like a storybook and not just like a bunch of jokes. It was called And to Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street. That's okay. quaint, I guess. Sounds cute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Based on his retellings, it was rejected by either 20 or 43 publishers, depending on. Oof. Who he told the story to? <laughs> Publishing industry. Well, I like rough. to tell stories. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a storyteller. And sometimes you got to stretch the truth to make it interesting, you know. So homeboy decides he's going to create like some constant characters for his comics. Things that he can like pull back. And like use again and again when he's doing like editorials or whatever. One of them was the China Man. Oh, which we can just—I don't need to put that on screen. We, yeah, I know, know what, what it looks, looks like. like. I know what it looks like. <laughs> I can picture it like, so clearly, and I hate it. Yeah, uh, and this is something he refused to change until 1978. Like flat out was just like, no. Mm. So when people are like, it was the time. Mm, Mm. No. No. Still no. So he's over. He's over the book. The one that he sent out to 20 to 48 people. He's walking home to burn the manuscript and say like, fuck this shit one day. When he bumped into an old Dartmouth peer who happened to have the power to get it published. And he did. So, like, yay connections, I guess. Yay that guy. Yeah. Yay nepotism. <laughs> we, which is actually the sponsor of today's video. Oh, nepotism. God, I wish. <laughs> I could really use some nepotism right now. Yeah. Instead, let's just go to an ad. So, he runs into his old friend. And is like, okay, I have this thing. Nobody wants it. And he was like, perfect, I'll take it. One of the conditions, though, for him to be to sign on with Random House Publishing was that he insisted it be in his actual contract that they would publish one of his erotic adult books that he had been working on for a while. It was called The Seven Lady Godivas. Dr. Seuss writing adult sexual books is sick. I think He's I've a sick, seen, sick man. I think I've seen an image or two from one of them. And yeah, it is just like naked ladies, but still drawn in Dr. Seuss's style. Yeah. Which is like weird. <laughs> it's so It'd fucking be disturbing. Different if he had if he used like a different art style. It was like less yeah, cartoonish. But it looking, he's like, so I draw two things: books for children and books for perverts. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, they also look exactly the same. <laughs> so, like, I don't love any of this. It feels like a weird little crossover. So it seems like all of your books are for perverts, but some of them <laughs> are for children. <laughs> like they're also that's for how children. this works out. This is how this shakes out. 
<laughs> so people they agreed with us they're actually <laughs> like, not here for not dr sexy. seuss's weird yeah. unsexy <laughs> cartoons about mm-hmm. like dumpy who looking freaks <laughs> Only 2,500 of the original 10,000 printed copies were sold. Good. Which is like, can you imagine somebody trusting you enough to print 10,000 books and you sell a quarter of them? Like. <laughs> and they're horny books. Like that, that yeah. is like rubbing salt into a so- wound. Oh, yeah. Then you just have a whole bunch of like pictures of naked bean faced ladies. Just like all over the house. Just too. Like, sitting everywhere. Yeah. Just piles of them. Dr. Seuss explained the failure, attributing it to the fact that he, quote, attempted to draw the sexiest babes I could. Nope. But they came out looking absurd. Yes. I'm like, that's yeah. <laughs> that's okay. true. They all look like olive oil. Yeah, why doesn't he know Popeye. how to draw a jawline or a chin? <laughs> the like, fact that that's a none good of them start. have chins is like, <laughs> like that made up animal that he drew is like more realistic than these women. No, okay, none of them have butt cracks either. Oh no, that's where sick. Do they poop from their mouths. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just like huh? sort of sealed up on one end, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that dog. South Park episode. A <laughs> dog that like comes out of the water and is like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, you all right? <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I'm picturing right here. It's hideous. Reissued by multitudinous demand is written on the the reissue of it, but that's only. Because he was already famous and people wanted to be like, haha, look at this gross, horny book that this sick old man drew. All of them have awful hair, too. Like every I single know. one of these seven lady the, Godivas. I just want to go through there with some like some really sharp scissors mm-hmm. and some dry shampoo. Like yes. <laughs> lady la- other than being naked, okay. The whole reason Lady Godiva was naked is because she had great hair. She was using not her the, hair to like cover her bits. Not these girls. Not these girls. <sighs> At least draw one with good hair. He couldn't. Yeah, he couldn't it's do really it. rude. No. What a failure. Fucking sick. Yeah. I hope he dies. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> he wrote. I just four remembered more what books. podcast we're on. <laughs> He wrote four more books before World War II began, and he felt called to pivot to political cartoons, of which Seuss would draw over 400 in two years for the New York City paper, The PM. His drawings, which were later published in a book called Dr. Seuss Goes to War. <laughs> Just like yeah. such, that tar- title is hard as fuck. It's like, like Donald <laughs> Duck Goes to War. <laughs> Some of these cartoons, he's like, mocking Hitler or Mussolini, like a little based. Mm -hmm. But he also criticized people who didn't want the U.S. to get involved in the war, like like Charles Lindbergh. So That's okay. We can (sighs) criticize Charles Lindbergh. Yeah. I'm I'm actually fine with like cartoonists criticizing anyone. Like and of all of the wars (laughs) criticizing is fine. (laughs) Of all the wars to be like you you should want to get into this war. I would say that's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. Like Charles Lindbergh didn't want to go to World War II because he was a Nazi. Mm. That's always a bad thing to be. Like mm-hmm. on this podcast, we do we do like outright say yeah. not into Nazis. So many of these cartoons, as we know, deeply fucking racist. Mm -hmm. One named Signal from Home depicted racist caricatures of Japanese Americans being handed explosives in anticipation of a signal from home. Mm. This is fucking sick. The premise of it is Japan is getting people to come to America to... 
secretly be like sleeper agents. So this is in support of, it specifically says California and it has a bunch Mm -hmm. of buck toothed, almond eyed Asian people coming into California and Oregon. So this is like clearly in support of like internment camps. Mm -hmm. They're handing out TNT to them because he's, he's arguing that every single one of them is a possible sleeper agent. Yep. Yeah, so that's... even though it's propaganda, it's well, I'm gonna get into it. Uh, I'm gonna give him like a real, I'm gonna give a real quote where he explains his thinking on this. So even though it's propaganda is also targeting uh like the Nazis and other perceived enemies of the state that are actual enemies that should be <laughs> targeted, he reserved his most virulent vitriol for Japanese people. And like you just said, was an ardent and outspoken spokesperson for internment camps. Here's a quote. But right now, when the slur for Japanese people that I'm not saying Mm -hmm. are planting their hatchets in our skulls, it seems like a hell of a time for us to smile and warble, brothers, it is a rather flabby battle cry. If we want to win, we've got to kill slur for Japanese people. Whether it depresses John Haynes Holmes or not, we can get palsy wowsy afterward with those that are left. Those that are left. <sighs> palsy wowsy, as in palsy, not wowsy. murdering. There, that's, that's, it's, there's two genders. There's palsy mm-hmm. wowsy and I kill you. Also, like, I, as you can probably guess from this political cartoon, uh, the people getting dragged off to internment camps were not just Japanese Americans. It was every Asian American because yeah. they they weren't bothering to fucking check, were they? Well, they were all slur for Japanese people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my grandma a few years ago was talking about, like, how like sad it was like when her friends in the town that they grew up in got dragged off to internment camps and i don't think that town had a japanese population to speak of used to have a chinese population at one point Mm -hmm. it's legitimately fucking sick and to have somebody support it is monstrous but to be a public figure who fucking does children's work outspoken about it who to be yeah to be like an outspoken supporter to convince people that otherwise may be on the fence that this is the moral thing to do and that to do anything else would be stupid and could lead to their deaths like it's pure fucking like straight up xenophobic propaganda the kind Mm -hmm. of stuff you still hear today like Yep. The way he's held up, like I was so mad when I was doing my research. I like cried twice because I was like, this is this is pure and unadulterated vitriol. Like it's it's like mm-hmm. so toxic. It is poison. Even like having those thoughts in your mind is like toxic to yeah. your ability to have empathy for other people, to find any sort of like solidarity or community. Like it's it's so fucking disgusting. He refers and to them the f- as slurs. Yeah. He refers to them as slurs <laughs> and he draws them with slit eyes and bug teeth. Like yeah. this is like beyond racist. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is like, like, People on 4chan might be like, oh, mm. like that. Dial it <laughs> that back. Seems a little round. unfair. Yeah, yeah, dial it back. Like, we're, like <laughs> people are gonna like. You're supposed to at least attempt to like hide this under like white supremacist yeah. talking points about <laughs> like like save the you're slur. Like, yeah, like keep the like caravan mask, thing that you've sweetie. got going on. Yeah, <laughs> pull up your mouth, baby. It's slipping. <laughs> <laughs> So many of his books shared similar racist caricatures. If I Ran the Zoo has two men from Africa wearing grass skirts without shirts or shoes. 
He frequently used demeaning depictions of Black people in his editorial cartoons, and these depictions were often used to support arguments. One of his most damaging cartoons was a picture of a man from Japan standing next to Hitler. On March 5th, 1942, it was published in the newspaper PM. It read, what have you done today to help save your country from them? I don't, <laughs> That's the first time I cried <laughs> when reading this, because that is like, what can you possibly... What can you possibly say about that ever? You can never make that up. You can never take that back. You can never change. Like this got circulated around. Like it's not even like it was just something he was saying. Yeah. Like this was like his content. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. he, he was a racist influencer. And I want to say like circling back to like his political cartoons being in high school textbooks. When I was in high school, at least it was not these ones. It was the ones that were like, and even Dr. Seuss got in on the yep. pro liberation. I'm not surprised. I was about to be like, I can't believe they would let a racist in an American textbook. <laughs> I was like, okay, wait, Galen, you know this one. <laughs> yeah, That's I mean, who like, wrote them. <laughs> and I mean, again, like it is morally justified to go to war against the Nazis. It is morally justified to go to war against uh, the Japanese empire, but that doesn't justify racism against like, an, uh, against like your fellow Americans. Yeah. Against civilians as well. Like yeah. there's this, there's always this idea um, when it comes to like the xenophobic mm -hmm. othering of these people are against you. Every single one of them is against you. They were taught, yeah, like from birth, to hate you and the American way of life. And it's like, no, that's you, babe. Yeah, <laughs> like you're the one <laughs> who's reading the shit in your newspapers every day. You're the one who looks at an army and sees, like, all of its people, and is yeah. able to justify striking back against innocent civilians for the actions of a government that they do not control. Yeah. And they'll like in the same breath, they'll be like, that's a fucking dictatorship and the civilians are to blame. It's like, well, <laughs> how's that work? Uh, yeah. Total war is like never, ever justifiable in no. my mind. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's fucking disgusting. So I have a quote from Professor of Children's and Young Adult Literature, Ebony Thomas, because I wasn't going to have this discussion without getting some input from someone who actually studies literature and right. isn't an old-ass white man. Mm -hmm. Quote, in Dr. Seuss's books, we have a kind of sensibility which is oriented towards centering the white child and decentering everyone else. Dr. Seuss was shaped by a completely immersive white supremacist culture. Even during that time, our ancestors and elders were protesting racist works and producing alternative stories for our children. How do we decide what endures and what doesn't endure? It's our responsibility to decide what kind of books to put in front of our kids. End quote which I think is a point that I touched on this briefly earlier, but like mm -hmm. even for the time people were like, that's fucked up. Maybe not yeah. the majority of white people, but that doesn't matter. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's so many children's books, artists, like there, there's so many children's books. You don't, you don't need to. Yeah. It's also ugly. Uh <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing about his books. <laughs> I can tell you right now, my friends and I would have killed that cat with hammers if he came into our home. <laughs> Started juggling my fish or whatever the fuck. <laughs> I don't think so, you goddamn rat. <laughs> A 2019 examination of Seuss's works revealed that just 2% of human characters were people of color. Yeah, I don't remember seeing... I don't remember seeing a single one. Well, good. They've all been blonde. <laughs> oh, I yeah, don't want they're bad. Him to, <laughs> yeah, I don't want him to draw them. <laughs> I do not want him drawing a person of color. <laughs> like, 
Like, I think that ship has sailed. I think we're done being like, well, mm-hmm. maybe could you draw them less racist? Like, no. Mm-hmm. Why don't you stay the fuck away? <laughs> <laughs> Get black people's faces out of your pen. <laughs> get that, get black people's faces out of your mouth. <laughs> the study found that depictions and mentions of black characters were heavily influenced by stereotypes against black people and depictions of white supremacy. Despite the blatant racism, many of his books express his views on a wide variety of social and political issues that he, heavy air quotes, leans left on. The Lorax, 1971, about environmentalism and Mm anti-consumerism. The Sneetches, about racial equality, which like, mm. The Butter Battle Book, about the arms race. I remember that. Yertle the Turtle, about Hitler and anti-authoritarianism. The Grinch, criticizing the economic materialism and consumerism of the Christmas season. And Horton Hears a Who, about anti-isolationism and internationalism. So like, a lot of... A lot of his books did have a message that I don't think yeah. are necessarily harmful, but I also don't think you need to get it from him. Yeah. I think you can teach about commercialism and how capitalism is bad without The Grinch Stole Christmas. Every single Christmas movie is about how commercialism <laughs> is bad. <laughs> like, Every literally, single one. spin the fucking wheel, bitch. Yeah. Like... <laughs> this sucks because i do really like the jim carrey grinch me too he was said to have rescinded his animosity towards japanese people after the war oh using thank you (laughs) i'm done with that now (laughs) (laughs) i'm actually over it i'm in my beef squashed era yeah (laughs) fucking die we're cool now right (laughs) fuck off Um, So, Horton Hears a Who was an allegory for the American post-war occupation of Japan, and he dedicated the book to his Japanese friend. Oh, he has the one. He has the token. Yeah. It's like Fred Phelps, like, right before he dies, Mm -hmm. like, dedicating, like, God hates fags to, I don't know, who's gay? Elton John? Like, <laughs> honestly iconic yeah <laughs> dedicating god hates fags to elton john would legitimately be fucking based and elton john would think so too oh 100 <laughs> percent. okay maybe i do need to write a book called god hates fags and then the entire book is just dedication to everyone <laughs> dedication to everyone that i think is gay <laughs> just like oh <laughs> just 300 That's pages so mean <laughs> And some just of them like are like wildly off base too, just like random people, like Tommy yeah. B from grade two, <laughs> like, <laughs> definitely gay. God hates you. <laughs> God hates you, Tommy B. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy D, you're cool though. So the company that's continuing on his legacy. Dr. Seuss Enterprises announced on March 2nd, 2021, that it would stop publishing and licensing six of Seuss's works, including And to Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street if I Ran the Zoo, um, and a few other ones. They're all here, but I don't care. <laughs> the most important thing is that they went woke. Oh. They went disgustingly woke. Seuss and they is woke. stole, they broke in. To every single conservative person's home and snatch these books that they never owned right Mm -hmm. out of their children's crying hands. Mm -hmm. I heard about that. I remember that. Yeah. I remember when Matt Walsh was so mad that he didn't have seven Lady Godivas. (laughs) (laughs) He was like, my kids deserve to be masturbating over that book. (laughs) Uh, So they said, ceasing sales of these books is only part of our commitment and our broader plan to ensure Dr. Seuss Enterprises catalog represents and supports all communities and families, which like, shut up. (laughs) Just like 2021. 2021. Yeah. They they stopped printing more. (laughs) Yeah. They waited until there was like hundreds of thousands in circulation. Yeah. 
Which is a thing that like happens a like with non-controversial books too. If they just don't sell very well, yeah. they'll like stop printing just them. Stop so printing that's them. Clearly what they did. But then they're like, Yeah. This is about we're, sales 100 yeah, percent Yeah. But they're like, we just want to make an announcement that we're doing a woke right now. Yeah. And all the people that wanted these books for like cute little racist purposes, they want like first editions. They don't want yeah. like something from Barnes and Noble. Like you want like the yeah. classic racism. Your racism needs you're to be for. collectible. Yeah. If you're if you're a racist collector, like you want it to appreciate an, in value. Yeah. <laughs> So the publisher admitted that the books portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong and just flat out renounce them, which, of course, uh, right-wing fans of racism attempted to punish the corporation for their speech. Lots of YouTube videos, podcasts, tweets. It was... I've never taken any of this seriously because they're mad about something else like every other day. They're so fragile. And I don't care. Like, I don't think the books should be in circulation, but I wasn't picketing libraries because they're there. Like, no. if I had seen it, maybe I would have taken it and dropped it in the toilet at the library. But I don't (laughs) go to libraries because I don't know where they are. (laughs) (laughs) I just buy all my books on Amazon and then return them after I'm done reading them. (laughs) I don't do that. The The library. (laughs) Why? Where do you library? (laughs) His cartoon supported Roosevelt's handling of the war, and he frequently went after Congress, particularly the Republican Party, the press, and anyone who criticized Roosevelt, and anything he thought led to dissension and infighting, which he believed was inadvertently helping the Nazis. So, like, he swings rapidly back and forth Mm -hmm. between, like, based and monster. Yeah. Multitudes, an onion, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Multitudes, onion, clocks. Broken clocks. <laughs> Nothing we say makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Like we're another day signifier. Out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally susing out for clocks. Oh my God. I, I'm such a seuss for clocks. I'm such a seuss for onions. I'm such a Seuss for, like, a dry, stringy hair. (laughs) Don't make any comments. I'm such a Seuss. YouTube, leave me alone. (laughs) Don't you dare. (laughs) If you're listening to this on Spotify, don't look up on YouTube. (laughs) So it is a little bit funny that he supported Roosevelt because when he was a child, he was scheduled to be honored as one of the top sellers of war bonds among the Boy Scouts, along with nine others. The president was supposed to give the Scouts a special thanks, but he only had nine medals to present, and there was ten of them. So President Roosevelt shouted, What's this boy doing here? When Seuss, who was tenth in line, came to the front. He was mortified and, like, dragged off the stage and developed a lifelong fear of crowds and people in general. That's so sad. Imagine the president being like, ew, what the fuck is even that? (laughs) Get it away from me. (laughs) And then they did. Nobody corrected him. They just did. (laughs) Nobody was like, he's supposed to be here. He's supposed to have an award. (laughs) They just just let it (laughs) <laughs> Ew, an orphan <laughs> So funny It wouldn't be funny if he hadn't turned out to be a terrible person But I actually believe in yeah. reverse karma <laughs> You had bad vibes as a kid <laughs> Yeah your, your, your terrible vibes as an adult Were like sent back in time And people could like yeah. And people And people could sense them, so they treated you appropriately. (laughs) Ew, who's this tiny racist? (laughs) Get it away from me. I like to imagine it was like the shepherd's crook. Oh, yeah, because he was on a stage. From old school school cartoons. Yeah. Because there was always somebody with like a crook. (laughs) 
I guess. A crook? Is that Stagecraft. A- Hook? Is it called uh, a shepherd? A- shepherd's crook. Shepherd's <laughs> cane? I don't know. If you know what they're crook? called, leave a comment. It's a crook. It's a crook. What the fuck? Why did I know that? Okay. Why did you know that? I don't know the name of Dartmouth University, <laughs> but I know every but you know tool. What, <laughs> but you know what Bo Peep's candy cane is called? <laughs> so in 1943, he becomes a captain in the army and commanded the animation department. <laughs> of the what? First- why is there an animation department? I swear to God. These these clowns are joking around with my fucking tax dollars. Why is there an animation department? Oh, I'm fucking dead. Okay, hold on. You gotta be you fucking become- kidding me. I don't get this healthcare. Like- <laughs> when you hire someone's grandson, you don't have a job for them. So it's like photocopy ink refiller (laughs) you just need to keep them out of everyone's hair (laughs) so i did one contract on a ship and um in our like um emergency drills like with with the because we were all assigned like different life rafts um one of the officers was like uh and if someone is freaking out we've got like a fishing rod in here uh we don't actually we don't need the fish but if you tell them to fish uh because we can drink the blood of the fish for for hydration or whatever um it'll give someone who's freaking out something to do <laughs> but they were like if we're out on the sea long enough that we're running out of like food then um we're we're already dead oh that's so comforting <laughs> yeah but they were like you can you can make someone fish to calm them down you can give them a bullshit fake job So (laughs) he became a captain in the army and commanded the animation department of the first motion picture unit. (laughs) Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Of the United States Army Air Force. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) The sentence sent me spiraling. The the Commander of the animation department of the first motion picture unit of the United States Army Air Forces. This is why they call it the Chair Force. Yeah. He also wrote movies. That's what he was doing there. Like propaganda films? Yeah. Okay. After the war, him and his wife moved to San Diego and he went back to kids' books. In 1953, he wrote the musical fantasy film... The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. The what? <laughs> it's so terrifying. The way I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like I'm even just trying to picture 5,000 fingers on one hand. Uh, no, no, it's moving your camera. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be so annoying to cut. Stay the I'm fuck sorry. still. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Turn that setting off. <laughs> Uh, so the 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T failed horribly, as you might expect. Who wanted to see 5,000 Fingers on a single Nobody. doctor? No, that's too many. <laughs> that's simply too many. It's the same reason m- my friends and I would have killed him with hammers. The same way what, when you see a centipede, doing- you crush it because it's too many legs. It's too many legs. What is he doing with all those fingers? Nothing good. What are they doing with all those legs? Nothing good. Nothing Climbing good. Climbing on your face when you sleep. That's what he's doing. <laughs> he actually walks with his fingers <laughs> upside down. <laughs> oh, no. They just line his body like a centipede. <laughs> this is a, such a delicious podcast. That's like the worst thing I've heard since the teeth slide. Yeah. Um, he never made a movie again. Good. So <laughs> good. I love that. We don't want him. Good. 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 You stay the fuck out of this industry. <laughs> you stay the fuck out away of my you stay the fuck away from my imagination. <laughs> the shit you put in there. <laughs> A report published in May 1954 concluded that children were not learning to read because their books were boring. <laughs> the education division. So at, true. Oh, I know, right? So true, bestie. 
The education division, headed by William Ellsworth Spalding, compiled a list of 348 words he thought were crucial for first graders to understand. He told Seuss to write a book using only 250 words, which is like a fun little challenge. Like that actually sounds dope. Like just like a little like I'm doing an October writing challenge thing. That sounds fun. Spalding said he wanted Seuss to make a book that kids would love again. And nine months later, Seuss finished a book using 236 of the words like he was baby. given. Like a ba- oh, so he came in under the challenge. That's cool. Yeah. And it took him nine months like a baby. He gave mm. birth to it. Yeah. Although it retained the drawing style, verse rhythms, and all the imaginative power of his earlier works, it could be read by beginning readers because of its simplified vocabulary. It was called The Cat in the Hat. Oh, there's that freak. <laughs> there's a, there's a, where? <laughs> He's coming to your house. <laughs> you hear like 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 cop banging on the front door. <laughs> Anytime it's a rainy day, you have to bolt the door. <laughs> That's so terrifying. There's gotta be like a scary version. Oh yeah, the one with Mike Myers is pretty terrifying, actually, now that I think about it. Is he oh. dead? No, he's still alive. Well, we'll see you soon. You can bitch. have that one. He's Canadian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what things so, you've given us? <laughs> <laughs> you'll take your beaver and you'll like it. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. <laughs> you did give us Celine Dion, so yeah, I mean, that and had poutine. to make, make up for some of it. <laughs> or like how my boyfriend would say, puta. Puta. I don't know. Sorry to my boyfriend. I don't think he actually sounds like that. That's just like <laughs> me making fun of French people. I only like fancy poutines, though. I don't like classic poutine. Like I like a good red <laughs> wine reduction. I only like poutines that like aren't poutine. Like they don't taste like they're from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> so Cat in the Hat, children's book, annoying, easily understood rhymes, success. So he kept it going. All of his books after that were like, what are some easy to understand words that children need to learn? And that's why they made it. It's because teachers were like, okay, this is actually perfect for my fucking classroom. Libraries were stalking them. They used to care that whether or not kids could read. They don't anymore. But that used to be like a really big thing. (laughs) They cannot read. They cannot spell. They cannot think. It's legitimately fucking scary. <laughs> we need like a non-racist there. Dr. Seuss to come and save yeah. them. In 1955, Dartmouth awarded him with an honorary doctorate of humane letters. Oh, with fuck note- off. I know. That's cheating. Uh, That's cheating. You don't just I get know, to draw uh, some doodles and have a doctorate. <laughs> Who peer-reviewed your thesis? Who peer-reviewed that doodle? <laughs> Somebody looked at those racist little doodles and they were like, "Mm, seems like something a doctor would write. (laughs) So this was the note attached to it. Creator and fancier of fanciful beasts, your affinity for flying elephants and man-eating mosquitoes makes us rejoice you were not around to be director of admissions on Mr. Noah's Ark. These people are fucking disgusting. So nerdy. I so know. Gross. Can I also say, so- just for the record, um, I am so like impressed with the restraint that you showed not doing a rhyming intro. Because if you had done that, I would have flown to Canada and I would have fucking <laughs> throttled you. I added two, two <laughs> rhymes, but they were not Dr. Seuss rhymes. Um And they were not noticeable unless you go back and listen to it. I was very intentionally subtle. Because I actually fucking hate poetry that relies entirely on consistent rhyming. Little rhyming There's no like... Yeah. It's... Yeah. Oh, so they made a term for that now. (laughs) I'm so glad they're catching up. (laughs) I'll write that down. (laughs) 
I'll update the I'll update my Wikipedia page on things I hate <laughs> about poetry. <laughs> Your affinity for flying elephants and man-eating mosquitoes makes us rejoice you were not around to be director of admissions on Mr. Noah's Ark. But our rejoicing in your career is far more positive. As author and artist, you single-handedly have stood as St. George between a generation of exhausted parents and the demon dragon of unexhausted children on a rainy mm. day. I know. It's there so was whimsical. <laughs> Fucking makes me sick. There was an imitable <laughs> wriggle in your work long before you became a producer of motion pictures and animated cartoons. And as always, with the best of humor, behind the fun, there has been intelligence, kindness, and a feel for humankind. Mm. An Academy Award winner and holder of the Legion of Merit for war film work, you have stood these many years in the academic shadow of your learned friend, Dr. Seuss. And because we are sure the time has come when the good doctor would want you to walk by his side as a full equal, and because your college delights to acknowledge the distinction of a loyal son, Dartmouth confers on you her Doctorate of Humane Letters. He joked that he would now have to sign his name as Dr. Dr. Seuss. Okay, that is funny. Dr. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Which I would have uh, if I was him. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. What does humane letters mean? I have no fucking idea. I guess you're in the humanities. Yeah, like, something in the humanities. <laughs> we don't know what because you didn't earn this doctorate. Yeah, because you've done literally nothing for this. (laughs) Another L for the Academy Awards. (laughs) So, Dr. Dr. Seuss, kind of a dad joke. Yeah. Well, dad minus the children, which he did not want, except for his fake ones. He was once quoted as saying, you have them, I'll entertain them. Which is like a weird thing to say. Uh, We've already talked about the imaginary child named Chrysanthemum Pearl he shared with his wife. And while others boasted about their children, Seuss would instead discuss the adventures of his invented offspring. And there was always like, oh yeah, she can do this, she can do that. He would sit at dinner parties and just lie to people's face. It must suck so much to be a child, to be the child of someone who has an imaginary kid that they're proud of. Well, he had no real children. Oh, I thought he had. I thought you were saying he had a real child as well as the no. imaginary children. No, only <sighs> only his fake ass children. But it would have okay. actually been okay. That's hilarious. <sighs> I, was, I, I was like sitting at the dinner like, table, and he's like he's gabbing and boasted about chrysanthemum, and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Eddie's sitting right there, just like <sighs> muttering to himself. <laughs> <laughs> trying to like get his thousand fingers to like, pick up his fork. <laughs> Chrysanthemum even appeared on their Christmas cards and he dedicated the 500 hats of Bartholomew Cubbins to her, mentioning her age as 89 months going on 90. It's okay. At one point, Seuss had six neighborhood children pose with him and Helen for their annual Christmas card. As Norval Wally Wickersham Miggles Boo Boo Snud and Chrysanthemum, of course. Right. When he was getting the award, when they were offering him the doctorate, he had to put it off for a bit, though, as his wife was ill. She had, in fact, been ill for a long time, struggling quite a lot, during which Seuss was reportedly having an affair while his wife was homesick. In October 1967, Helen died by suicide. And eight months later, he was remarried to Audrey Dimond. Yeah, fuck this guy. Now, the internet is very mad at him for this. This is what they bring up. They do not... They're like, Dr. Seuss was the worst person in the world. He cheated on his wife, who was sick. I'm like, well... All the like racism and internment yeah. cat stuff like really sort like of hit me a little worse. bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a shitty thing to do and a thing that like is depressingly common. Like men having yeah. their wives get really sick and either like cheating on them or divorcing them while their wives are really sick. Yeah. Which is a horrible thing to do to someone. Mm-hmm. I don't think you should have to stay with someone because they're ill. No. But leaving them home alone 
with no one to care for them. <laughs> to go have an affair is it's yeah. rude. And then to come to home and lie. Least. Yeah. <laughs> Not okay. Okay, this is a little this is a little rude, but it was I I guffawed when I saw it. I was I was looking up some of the reasons why people hated him during the beginning of my research. And one of the first comments on the Reddit thread was, he really said, one bitch, two bitch, dead bitch, new bitch. <laughs> and that... I'm sorry. But like... <laughs> Gagged. <laughs> Gagged. Yeah. Poor woman. A better writer I... than Dr. Seuss. Literally. literally. <laughs> so, Okay. I had to get that out of the way because I couldn't read that after what I'm about to read, which is incredibly fucking depressing. So she had struggled with her health throughout their entire 40-year marriage, and for more than a decade leading up to her death, she was partially paralyzed. At the time she died, she was also going through dealing with cancer. So paralyzed, has cancer, husband not around, and she knew about the affair. And according to everyone, it left her despondent. And people say, like, he killed his wife. Not actually, but his yeah. actions led to but, her death. And I don't, I don't yeah. ever really agree with saying somebody caused somebody else to die by suicide. Suicide is always, like, there's always multiple factors going yeah. on. But... Yeah. I could see how if you are already going through um, yeah. such I, it unimaginable, could push you over the edge. yeah, that would be the thing that would that would break you. Being alone during that yeah. is fucking terrifying. Horrible. That would that would be, I think, the most awful part of it. Mm -hmm. That's the most awful part of dealing with anything is if yeah. you are alone and the person that you love. Doesn't even has give abandoned a fuck. you. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, the abandonment. Of, yeah, it'd be one thing if he was having an affair, but that entire time he was also like very attentive to his wife. Yeah, you know, like I'm going he, out to the store to get your silly yeah. medication, and then sucking a dick or whatever. Like, yeah, fine, I'm, <laughs> whatever. I'm moving. I'm moving my my sweet little hot mistress into the spare room. <laughs> Sorry, but we we just want to make sure that we're always near you. <sighs> Let's take a little ad break, and then when we come okay. back, we'll have some space from that joke to this next horrible thing. <laughs> okay. In Helen's suicide note, she wrote, Dear Ted, what has happened to us? I don't know. I feel myself in a spiral going down, down, down into a black hole from which there is no escape, no brightness, and loud in my ears from every side, I hear failure, failure, failure. I love you so much. I am too old and enmeshed in everything you do and are that I cannot conceive of life without you. My going will leave quite a rumor, but you can say I was overworked and overwrought. Your reputation with your friends and fans will not be harmed. Sometimes think of the fun we had all through the years. That, she like, supported him from the I'm start. Like, <laughs> she, I know. She supported him from the start. She encouraged to the him end. To, to become the man he became. And then when he betrayed her and abandoned her in her in her hour of need, she was still thinking about his reputation and his feelings. I, this it's this is the so second time depressing. I cried doing it's, the research, like reading that. And like, I could see myself saying something like that. Like, because yeah. what are you trying to do? You're trying to, if you really love someone, you're not trying to go out spitefully. You're not trying to like, the reason why... She was removing herself. Was because she loved him. That's so Like, she did up. it for her, and she did it for him. For him. Like, ugh. 
Like obviously That's she had fucking so cancer funny. and she was paralyzed. Like she there was yeah. there was a lot of things that there's were other contributing things going to on. It, yeah. But like And maybe maybe is, there to an extent she knew she was going to die anyway and she wanted to go yeah. out on her own terms, which I totally think is fine. But this was yeah. clearly not like no. that the the illness is only one part of the equation here. A major part of it is him. Because that's yeah. who she's thinking about. Yeah. Which is just like, it's hard. It's legitimately fucking heartbreaking. That's awful. <sighs> so everyone that knew her was, their summation was basically what we got from the letter, which was she was more scared of living without him than living in pain. Like she that's would have been willing so... to suffer if she had been able to suffer with him there. But that Which was is her like, last hope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And back then, he would have been shunned for that infidelity. His, Did he their indicate friends, any kind of remorse? Not that I've ever seen. He was very happy with his new wife. <sighs> yeah. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted him to die really quickly after that because I fucking hate him so much. So... His, Did he? his achievements <laughs> at that point, yeah. His achievements, like, after that were not very many. Like, he wasn't really writing. He wasn't... Yeah. He 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 put out his work. He got his accolades. He had his money. And on September 24th, 1991, Seuss passed away of cancer at the age of 87 at his home in San Diego. And his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean. His new wife oversaw his estate until her death on December 19th, 2018, at the age of 97. So I think she was maybe a little racist, too. And that's why it took them till 2021 (laughs) to do anything with it, because new people had to take over. Yeah. Or maybe she's just like, like, I don't... We have to keep the Africans in grass skirts. I love those. Like, I'm I'm sorry, but like... (laughs) They're really cool. Like, I have paintings of them all up on the house. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you do. Yeah. Four years after his death, the University of California, San Diego's University Library Building, was renamed Geisel Library in honor of Geisel and Audrey for their generous contributions to the library and their dedication to improving literacy. What about his first wife's dedication to improving literacy? Nothing. Feels like she dedicated the one that more got of her him. life to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's dead. I hope it hurt. I really fucking do too. I really hope and the cancer hurt. I know hurt. that he wasn't alone, but I really wish. I like it's so petty, <laughs> but like this is why. I had to go back in time and tell Roosevelt to yell at him on stage mm-hmm. because I was like, <laughs> this little bitch, it's good. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't have it coming in the future. He doesn't yeah. get what he deserves. And I fucking hate it when people are like, he'll get what he deserves in the end. And they like, not do. unless we work hard. We've been doing this not podcast unless- <laughs> way too long. These monsters <laughs> always live forever and they die very comfortable. It... Because the worst people are always rich. That's <laughs> like, so true. I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, I mean, I'm not sorry, but I know it's a little overgeneralizing, but a lot of the time it's true. Like when you're a bad person mm, and you're poor, you either end up in jail or dead. Like you get your shit Yeah, and nobody real fast. tells your story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like <sighs> so yeah, sorry for ruining your night, but there's Dr. Seuss. Fuck him. Fuck him and his ugly naked ladies. <laughs> this is why I also didn't give like a cutesy little fucking rhyme at the beginning. There there were two, Girl and Pearl and Moose and Seuss, but they were all two lines apart. <laughs> it's like it's like two guys in a hot tub. You're five feet apart, so you're not gay. Like yeah. <laughs> You need you need to there's opposite no opposite ends. <laughs> I want you I want every rhyme at opposite ends of this right now. Opposite ends or, of the pool. Right the fuck now. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, I'm Kaylin Conrad. You can find me on YouTube at Kaylin Conrad and on Twitter at Kaylin Conrad. 
I'm a Hoots. You can find me on Twitter at Punished Hoots. <laughs> and you can find me on YouTube at Hoots YouTube. And we have a Patreon that would be like so hot if you were to join, where you can do things like, so every week after an episode like this, we sit down and we debrief a little. Um, sometimes it's sad. <laughs> sometimes we're just letting off steam. But we just have a little after dark conversation, which we call the autopsy. And those are available in the morgue only for our patrons. And at a certain tier, um, you can also add a suggestion to our suggestion cemetery if you really want us to cover someone. It has to be like someone famous, though. You can't be like, so my, my aunt. uncle. <laughs> <laughs> we both went for our parents' sibling. <laughs> my aunt is such a fucking see you next Tuesday. And I'd really <laughs> like you to take her down a peg. She just died. Here's her obituary. <laughs> oh, yeah. She was an obituary. <laughs> oh, that's so much better than the morgue. <laughs> Damn it. Welcome, welcome to our obituary. <laughs> okay, you know what? <laughs> okay, every year from now on in up. January, in every year from now in January, January is now obituary. Um, <gasps> Love it. We'll, yeah. We'll we have a year special. to plan whatever we'll that means. We'll have a party. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bye. Bye.